So good afternoon, everybody. I'm sorry I'm late. I just broke my little toe last Thursday morning. So when on Thursday, when I thought I was already having a lot of pain, but I just went to the doctor on Friday. I got a note from the doctor saying that I should teach from Zoom for two weeks, but it was not accepted by the university. So I'm here in person. And, but anyways, that's not an excuse for me to come in five minutes late. I just underestimated the amount of time that I would take to walk from the parking lot to here. And also I underestimated the heat. <laughs> so that's all cool. Uh, so we will continue today on the lecture about word population change over time. We actually did go through the five contemporary aspects of importance in demography, really huge population growth, decline in mortality, decline in fertility, more boys being born than girls, and that's really clear in specific countries. And Related to the fact that we have lower fertility and lower mortality, we have a process of population aging, a higher proportion of people in labor ages. Uh, so we went through this and I talked to you about the demographic transition. And I mentioned that questions about the four stages of the demographic transition in our exam and quizzes are based on this slide that's from uh, the textbook. I just put this other slide here and it kind of subdivides stage three from here into stage three and four in this slide, just because it shows how population was kind of stable in this period of high birth and death rates, increased a lot when mortality declined a lot. And um, and more recently, because fertility rates declined, population started to increase not so much. And then I kind of finalized the last class talking about the doubling times. This is just a technique, pretty much like this simple equation here that we can see, okay, let's say that we have this specific population growth rate in a specific country in a specific year. Let's say that this population growth rate keeps the same in the next few years. How many years would it take for the population nowadays to double in size? And also, if I have a negative population growth rate, if that negative population growth rate remains the same in the next few years, how many years would it take for the population to decrease by half of its size? So that's what pretty much this exercise here tries to do. And one equation about uh, the exponential growth rate in demography is this one here. What is this exponential growth rate equation in demography says? Based on the population at the beginning of the period and a population growth rate usually estimated for every year, we, if it's every year, the T here equals one, and I have a base population, the growth rate, it's kind of like an indicator that summarizes information about fertility, mortality, and migration. Fertility increases population, mortality decreases population, and then migration can both increase and decrease. Immigration increases, immigration decreases. So the combination of these components, they give us the summary, which is the population growth rate. And then we can estimate how much is gonna be the population the next year. If the population growth rate that we observed for this previous year remains the same. But what's the exercise that we are trying to do here with this doubling time that's discussed in the textbook? We want to know how many years, we want to know T, that's the question. T is what we don't know. How many years would it take 
for the current population, let's say we have a population K0, to grow in, to get into the double of the size that's currently today. How much is the double of K0 is how much we want to have here in the left-hand side of the equation. We want to know how many years would it take for this population to double in size if the current population growth rate remains the same. So we want to know when this number here will be equal two times this number. So the left-hand side of the equation becomes two times the population in time zero equals the exponential of the population growth rate and the T that's gonna be the result in this formula it's going to be how many years it's going to take us to double the population size, given this base population and given this population growth rate that we have nowadays. Since K0 is multiplying both sides of the equation, we just cancel it and we have 2 equals the exponential of RT. And in order to take the exponential out of this equation, we just take the log in both sides of the equation. So we have log of two on the left-hand side and log of this will give us RT. And just our, our question is how many years is gonna take? So we want to put the T isolated in, on the left-hand side or by itself in one side of the equation. So we pretty much have to get the R here that's multiplying and send to the other side dividing. So we're gonna have the time to double equals the log of two divided by R. An approximation of log of two is 0.6931. That's why this rule is called the rule of 69.3 because of this. So, and if we round it up even more, let's say that we can calculate the time to double a population, give a specific population growth rate, and it's gonna be around 0.7 divided by the population growth rate. And the example that I gave in the last class, at the end of the last class, was let's think of a population growth rate uh, of 1%. That means that the population is growing 1% per year. 1% in proportional terms is 0 0.01. So 0.7 divided by 0.01 if we have a population that's growing at 1% per year and we expect this growth rate to be the same in the next years, 0.7 divided by 0 0.01, we expect this population to double in 70 years from now, okay? So, and if we have a negative population growth rate, the result here is gonna be a T negative. What is a T negative? It's gonna mean how many years it's gonna take for the population to uh, be half of the size of what it is today, right? And this is just a historical example of the word population. In 8,000 BC, the population was around 5 million people. 1 AD, 250 million people. So the growth rate between this time point to this time point was 0.0004 or 0.0005, right? And then if we just divide, the log, we get the log of two and divide by this growth rate, you would say if the population grows so slowly like that, it would take 1,000, 417 years for the population to double in size. To go from five to 10 million, the population would take, the, the population would take this amount of years to double in size. And then from one AD to the year 600, the population actually decreased from 250 million to 200 million. So the population growth rate was negative. Log of two divided by this, we have minus 1,878, 58 years, which means that if this population keeps growing, keeps decreasing by this rate, 
we will decline from 250 million to 125 million in 1,858 years. Okay, why is this number here interesting? Because it just shows to us that in the years and the decades where population grew a lot, for example, from 1950 to 1975, it grew from around 2.6 million to 4.1 million, a growth rate of 0 0.0, almost 0 0.02. Log of two divided by this is saying that our population would increase from 2.6 to around 2.6 to around 5.2 million in only 37 years, because this growth rate is really high, much higher compared to this one here. So here we would increase from 2.6 to, to 5.2 in only 37 years. The population growth rate decreased a little bit in the following decades, but it's still high, 0 0.015. The population increased from around 4.1 million in 1975 to 6.1 million in 2000. So we would expect if the population growth rate remained the same, nothing changed, our population would grow from around 4.1 million, sorry, sorry, 4.1 billion to 8.2 billion in 43 years. Here it will increase from 2.6 to 5.2 billion in 37 years. Here it would increase 4.1 billion to 8.2 billion in 43 years. So this is just a simple exercise that if you have the population size for a specific area, in two points in time, you first calculate the population growth rate, and then afterwards you calculate this. How exactly do I calculate the population growth rate if I have the two population? So for example, the last one here, we have the population of 4.1 billion, 6.1 billion. And how many years between them? 25 years. So we just go back to that formula in the previous slide. And then we have here, the K0 is 4.1 billion, 4.1. KT is 6.1, I put it here. How many years in between them? 25 years. So I have everything in this equation, but R. So I calculate R first. I calculate R using this first formula here, and I put that R right here. Then afterwards, I go back to that same equation, but already transform into this simple form here to calculate the amount of times that the population will double. And I divide the log of two by this R that I just calculated before. And then I'm gonna get the 43. Right, so with two years, two sides of the population, you first calculate R, and then afterwards, you calculate the doubling times with that same equation from the previous slide. Is that clear? It just gives us an information of, of the pace that the population is growing. And growth rate, like I said before, is a summary of the contribution of all the demographic components, fertility, mortality, and migration, okay? And this is just from another textbook, kind of showing which were the years that the population reached exactly, or like around 1 billion people, two, three, four, until what we expect that we will reach 10 billion people in the world. And it's just showing, it's again, with that same formula, I have these two population sizes in two time points. So I have K0, KT, and the number of years between them, I can calculate the annual growth rate, right? And with this annual growth rate, I have an annual increase in 4 million people in, in the world between these two years. 
But look at the annual growth rate. It starts to increase a lot, increases a lot in the 70s here. Why? Because it took us only 13 years from 74 to 87 to increase the population by one full billion from four to five. So only in these 13 years, we increased one by one billion. So annual growth rate equals 2%. Yeah, in this case here, the, the growth rate is in percentage terms. That gives us an annual increase in millions of 75. Population growth rate declined a little bit in the following years, but since K0, the population in time zero here, it's uh, bigger than what it was before, even with a smaller growth rate here, 1.6 compared to 2.0, I still have more people in absolute terms uh, growing my population per year, 82 million instead of 75, right? So really basic information to show us how population has been growing over time in these last centuries. I'm gonna show you here now pretty much the same information as before, the population, um, population size from the last decades until our like projections. These results are not exactly the same from one graph to the other, but they show the general trends. It's just because these projections are being done by different uh, demographers, by different agencies, right? So here, saying that the population reached uh, 3 billion right before 1960, 4 billion between 70 and 80, and then kept growing up, right? To 9 billion, as we expect, a little after 2040. Here, it's another way to emphasize how strong the population has been increasing. And it's, in this case, I don't have the absolute number of the population growth, but I have the population growth rate, the annual population growth rate in percentage terms. And then we see that between 1900 until around 1970s, that's where we experienced the highest the steepest population growth rates in the world. And exactly around 60s, 50s, and early 70s, those rates were really, really high. And we projected because of declines in fertility, we projected the population to decline in the next decades and or by 2100. And if you look at the data from the United Nations Population Division, which is public available in the website is in our course, the link to the, the UN Population Division is in our course website. Always when you have these projections, usually the projection agencies, they, they create different scenarios. So in this case, you usually get the medium variant from the United Nations. They have the low variant, medium variant, and high variant. They pretty much estimate population uh, size for the next decades based on different scenarios for fertility. If fertility decline much more than we have been experienced, they do this uh, scenario called a low variant. If fertility declines, but not as much and keeps them around the same pace as now, we have the medium variant. And what about if fertility goes back up? We have the high variant. So that's what this medium variant means here. Another way to show it from another textbook and going back further to the year um, minus 800 or 800, uh, sorry, 8,000 BC. Uh, the population, the, the population until the present time here, we have there's the red line until around 2000 when these estimations are from. And after 2000, we have the different projections, the low variant, or here it's called low projection, the medium projection, 
and the high projection, all based on different scenarios of what I think it's going to happen to fertility. I can also play a little bit with mortality, but most of this variation is driven by different simulations, different scenarios of fertility. Okay? From the textbook, same idea. Uh, this is data that estimates the population until we have the data until around 2000. And then we have the medium variant here, the curve in blue, the low variant in green, the medium, yeah, the, the sorry, the high variant in red, and the purple variant is pretty much saying, oh, let's say that fertility doesn't drop anymore. So in this case, they have like four different scenarios. And even in this high uh, projection scenario here, they are actually thinking about a little decline in fertility. And in this other one, the purple one, they do an exercise of saying, okay, let's just make fertility be the same as it is today for the next decades. And then we're gonna see this huge increase in population size and population in billions as well. These slides here, I pretty much, this one and the next one, I just uh, organized these tables based on this link on this video um, from this lecture by Hans Rosling that I have already talked to you here many times. So in the course website, if you just go there, um, this, this one here, don't panic, hands rustling, showing the facts about population. A specific point here, this, this video is almost one hour long. In a specific point, he tries to simplify all these different projections in a simple way. And I just got the information that he talked in the, in the video and organized it on these two slides this one by continent, and this one by age group. So let's go and see those. So by 2013, which is the year that he is showing in his presentation, the American continent, like whenever I talk here about America, I'm talking about the American continent. It's North America, Central America, South America. I never refer to America as only the United States. So population of Europe, 1 billion, population of Africa, 1 billion, and Asian, 4 billion. So around 7 billion people in 2013. So what is he saying is that based on the fertility trends, mortality and migration trends, what we expect in the American continent and the European continent is that population is not gonna change by 2050, it's gonna remain the same because it's people are getting older, fewer children, and people getting older live a little, little, a little longer, but at the same time, they will, uh, they will die sometime and they are just being replaced by the kids that are being born. In Africa and Asia, that's not the case between 2013 and 2050. Africa will double the size of population expected to double to around 2 billion by 2050. So that's a huge increase, population increasing in Africa. Uh, so uh, two times between 2013 and 2050. In Asia, also increasing by 1 billion, but starting from 4 to 5, because Asia has been already experienced uh, has been already experiencing some fertility decline. So the population will increase by 1 billion, but because the base population is so big. So we expect to reach around 9 billion by 2050. And then by 2100, American continent kind of stays the same, European continent the same, and the Asian continent the same, because then the fertility levels in Asia is going to be much lower and children being born just replacing the older population. But what happens to the African continent that still has high fertility? It will double in size again 
now from two to four. And the population will increase from nine to 11 billion. And his point is that after that, the population will not increase as much more than 11 billion. This 11 billion will be probably around the population of the world after to the year 2100. But what's going to happen? The, the issue there afterwards is not going to be about population growth anymore, as some people are concerned about it. Technically, population growth by itself is not an issue. There are other things that are related in terms of resources to the population. And the African continent being the poorest one and experience a lot of like poverty, inequality, and so on, lack of infrastructure, lack of health services, that's gonna be a huge pressure on the continent to provide well-being to its population that will increase from one to two to four within this period. Okay, so that's gonna be the issue here. And of course, the distribution of the population in the world is going to change. We're going to have even higher percentage of the population living in the African continent. In Asia, it's still going to be higher, but stable from 2050 and 2100. But in the American and European continent, the percentage of the world population living in those uh, continents will decline from 2050 to 2100, exactly because of this increase in the proportion of the population in the African continent. And then continue on his lecture, Hans Rosling shows it by age group. And here he breaks it down for the years 2013, projection to 2024, projection to 2050, and projection to 2100. So by 2013, we had around 2 billion children in the world between 0 and 14 years of age, 2 billion between 15 and 29, 1 billion this age group, 1 and 1. And overall, not a significant high number of people in older ages. And overall, the size of the population around 7 billion. And Hans Rosling is the one who created a term called child pick, like pick. My accent is not good for to say the word, but the word is P-E-A-K, pick. Like the highest number of children that we would reach in the world in absolute numbers. And his point was that the number of children will not increase as much more than 2 billion because fertility is gonna to tend to stabilize around two children per woman in, if you take the world, the world as a whole, right? Because you might see higher fertility in Africa, but really low fertility in other countries in the world, comparing to the African countries. So the number of children, as we project, will be kind of stable over time. But what happens too is that the previous generations, they will get older, and the mortality is declining. Some people will tend to live longer. So these people here will move up to here. These people here will move up to here. And these age groups are not specifically aligned with the years. I'm just putting a table format, what he showed in the video, but it gives us an idea of what's going to happen in the distribution of the world population by age group. These people move here. These people move here, and another 2 billion children will be born. These ones move here, these ones move there, these ones move there, and around the same number of children will be born. And then by 2050, we're going to have about the same number of children as we had before. These people get older, these people get older, and these people get older, right? These people get older, and around the same fertility, we have these numbers here. But also, because mortality is going to decline all over the world, what we expect is that we're going to gain a little bit more. We're going to gain now 1 billion people extra in the age group of people with at least six, 75 years of age. 
Of course, we have people with at least 75 years of age in those years here, but the amount is really small if you take the world as a whole. But then this project is based on this exercise, it's gonna be around 1 billion. And then that's not gonna change as much in the next decades if the levels of fertility and mortality remain similar. And migration is not really being accounted here because we are talking about the world, the population of the world as a whole, and we are breaking it down by age groups, okay? Is that all clear? So the world's population will continue to increase for the rest of our lives. Virtually all of it will take place in cities in developing countries. So exactly because fertility is still higher, as we saw in the previous tables in Africa and in Asia, the population will grow there. Of course, the population will grow a little more than 11 billion, but it's not gonna continue in that strong exponential growth that we saw in the 60s and 70s, for example, okay? And this is just a map representation of the population increase. And this is the projected population increase between 2015 to 2050. The countries in uh, darker blue, they are the ones expected to have population decline. And this one's here, increasing its population. Let me just see something here really quick. Uh, and this one is in absolute terms. So increasing between one to 13 million per year between 2015 and 2050. Yellow between 14 and 42. And then orange where the US is between 43 million to 89 million more people per year between 2015 and 2050. Until you see a country like um, India with like a huge population increase in these next decades. And then India is gonna be the most populated country in the world surpassing China. And we also see a lot of increase in African countries. And this is Nigeria having a really huge increase in population size in absolute numbers as well in these next years. But if we take into account the population at the beginning of the period and the population that we expect to reach and do this population as a, a percentage increase on each country. So of course, India as a whole, we had a lot of people because they already have a lot of people living there right now. But if we take into account where we are now and the percentage increase in the next years, the, the percentage increase for every year between 2015 and 2050, we see that the African countries are the ones that have you experienced the highest percentage population increases between these years here, right? And that's, that figure is related to that first table that I adopted from Hans Rosling video, the table by by continent, showing that the African countries are the ones who will keep increasing a lot in percentage terms, but actually also in absolute terms, right? This is the, the geographic distribution of the world's population 2015 to show that um, people are not randomly distributed in the world. And people are not randomly distributed even within countries. In the US, you have a higher concentration in the East Coast and the West Coast, but the um, Eastern half of the country has much more population than the Western half of the country. Mexico really concentrated around Mexico City. Brazil really concentrated around Sao Paulo, Rio, and overall around the coast and a smaller population more in the middle. Argentina also really concentrated around Buenos Aires. Like you see concentrations like in South Africa and I think that's Nigeria, uh, also concentration around the capital city. Capital cities in, or even capital of states 
in developing countries have a much larger population. That's not exactly the case in the US, like in Texas, Houston, Dallas, San Antonio have a larger population than Austin, but usually in developing countries, the capitals of the country and of the states, they have larger population, right? But you see also concentration, specific areas of India, China, and also not this uh, symmetric distribution uh, in European countries. So the distribution of the population on space, it's a great topic for discussion in demography. And it's a topic that kind of, it's really related to, to a geography. So a lot of geographers, they use a lot of the techniques, similar techniques that demographers use and vice versa to analyze this geographic distribution of population on the space. And here are the 10 most populous countries. So China, around 1.4 billion in 2015, India 1.3, US around 325 million. And we expect India exactly because that huge population increased in the next decades to have more people by 2050 compared to China. So India expected to have around 1.6 billion and China 1.4. In Nigeria, you saw in the map here how it was growing so much in absolute terms, we expected to increase from 183 to more than 400, 400 million people by 2015 is gonna be the third largest country in the world in terms of population size, passing the US, right? So in, in Brazil dropping, Pakistan kind of remain in the same position, Indonesia dropping a little bit, Ethiopia and the Philippines coming up here by 2050. And that's related to geographic distribution. So the distribution of the population will keep changing. The overall size of the population, we expect it to be around 11 billion by 2100, not change much after that. But the distribution, that's what matters, both in terms of countries, but also within countries, as we saw in this map here. And this is just another graph. This one, this table here, it's from another textbook that I, I got it from. And this one here is from the Pew Research Center. The Pew Research Center has really good surveys that they do by themselves about political beliefs, perceptions, all different kinds of aspects of the American society. But they also collect data from other sources and summarize them in a friendly way. The New York Times also does a really good job of summarizing data from other areas in kind of like really nice animated graphs and tables. And this is pretty much the same kind of information that we saw in the previous table and showing how countries are changing their population from 1950 to 2020 and 2100. And kind of like the colors here signify the continents or portions of the continent. And then China, going to second, India going to first, uh, Indonesia increasing, then declining again, Pakistan kind of remaining constant over time here after coming from the bottom. And so that's just another way to show it, how the countries have been increasing or decreasing over time, right? And the little bit of use of these color shades here help us understand who is increasing, who is declining over time or who disappears as the most populous countries in the world. Russia doesn't appear here anymore in this list after 2100. And what you see, most of the countries here in the list are from Asia in green or from Africa in, in orange, only the US outside of the con these two continents, right? And this data from the, the Pew Research Center organized the table, but their uh, source of analysis is exactly from the United Nations Population Division, right? And the, the projections uh, based on the 2019 uh, data, I mean, to, from 
historical data until 2019, the United Nations made some projections and Pew Research Center organized it. And some links to Pew Research Center, both to articles and data. I also have put links to, to the Pew Research Center resources in our course website as well. Yeah, so here, like by 2100, five of the world's 10 largest countries are projected to be in Africa. Nigeria, DR Congo, Ethiopia, Tanzania, and Egypt. Cool? Questions? So all this second half here of the slides, as I mentioned, this is all extra material. And that's from this other textbook by John Wicks. And it kind of like shows the also overall global population trends over time. And just use some maybe different examples, a little bit different language, but it's the same content as our textbook. So the specific topics here that were not covered before, I will not ask in questions in quizzes and exams, but they are available here for you to look at, okay? But it's pretty much similar um, information that we saw before. And in this case, even some examples for specific countries and areas in the globe. Whenever those slides have that uh, Cengage learning, the copyrights there, it's exactly from this textbook by John Weeks. And the one that I have been using in the classroom throughout the whole semester is this one here. Cool? Questions? So I already uploaded to the course website the slides related to population change in the US. So you can download them here and it's gonna be this set of slides here. I did add some slides uh, comparing to, to last semester that I when I taught this class related to the recent decline of life expectancy at birth in the US that we experienced from 2019 to 2020, really related to the pandemic and to other causes. So these slides, I'm gonna discuss them uh, right here, right? So here in this uh, lecture, focusing in the US, we, um, we discussed this overall population change in the US, and then some major demographic topics that have been kind of specific to, to the country. The US has the highest fertility rate among developed countries, maybe exactly because the higher percentage of immigrants and immigrants in the US tend to have higher, tend to have more children overall, uh, or even in like in a, the total fertility rate of immigrants tend to be higher than the US born population. In relation to the race ethnicity composition in the country, if we put together all non-Hispanic white people in one single group, that group will be the majority of the country by around 2044. And some researchers mentioned around by 2060. So it depends a little bit on the projections. I'm a little skeptical about this term, majority minority society, because you're pretty much getting the US put in one side, non-white, sorry, non-Hispanic whites, and the other side, everybody else. And you're saying that all these people here will be more than 50% of the population. But all these people here have completely different experiences in the country, right? And some of these people here actually reporting having two races, which one could be white and black, and they are putting here together, right? So this term is usually controversial because we are just subdividing the American population by two groups only in terms of race, ethnicity. And we know that this group here of all minorities, they have really different 
experiences and opportunities and education levels in the US. But it's pretty much the idea that the population is getting more diverse in terms of race, ethnicity, composition, and the non-Hispanic white population will be less than 50% of the country by 2044. I prefer to think about looking at the non-Hispanic white trend instead of simply emphasizing all these groups together. Changes of origin of undocumented immigrants, they tend to come from either European continent in the past, and nowadays it comes from more Latin American countries. There is an increase in the ages after first marriage. Men and women start to invest more in education and get good jobs before getting married. And then there is a delay, a postponement in getting married. And actually there's a decrease in the percentage of people marrying, an increase in, in cohabitation, people living together, but not formally married. And also increasing percentage of birth to women who are not married. Right, so I will talk about these seven topics based on information that we see from the textbook. So the overall population change in the US based on census data, the first census from 1790, an increase really exponential, much steeper uh, growth in the more recent decades compared to previous, previous centuries and population passing 300 million, sometimes some years before 2010, like uh, right after 2000. The overall uh, age sex structure in the US has been changing as well because fertility declines. So by 20, 1950, we already have an age sex structure that's not completely like a pyramid as we still see in developing countries but you still have a wider base. These graphs here, I got them from the United Nations and this based on their projections, based on the data that they have up to 2017. What I like about this graph is the, are the details here. So for children, for those zero to four, five to nine and 10 to 14, you see that the shades of uh, blue and yellow are a little lighter. People in working ages, a little darker, and people with at least 65 years of age, even darker. Kind of like giving us an idea of the dependency ratio, right? The elderly people and children comparing to the working age population. And these dotted lines here indicate how many more men for example, we have in the age group between zero to four, then women. So this is the amount of more kids that we have in that age group compared to, to, to women, right? Because we know that the sex ratio at birth is higher than 100%. So it means that we have more boys being born than girls. So you have more male children than female children. And that goes on until around they reach 20 years of age. And then you have similar number of uh, men and women in the group between 20 to 24. And then as you get older and women live longer than men, men die faster, you start to have on the other way around more women than men. So here in the age group between 65 60, I'm starting from zero to four. So that's uh, 65 to 69. We have this more women, this amount of more women than men in this specific age group, okay? But as we get through time, fertility declines compared to the um, people in working ages. And these numbers here in percentage terms, but we still see more men in younger ages. As women live longer, we expect it to have more women 
in older age groups. 2050, the curve starts to be even more um, rectangular because smaller fertility declines and mortality declines, so more people reach older ages. And by 2100, that's how we expect the age sex structure to be in the US. Excess of men up to around 70 years of age and excess of women later in, uh, in these age groups. A major thing about the US is the diversity of the population in terms of race, ethnicity, and also in terms of nativity, right? Uh, nativity here pretty much saying, were you born in the US or were you born outside of the US? Those born in the US are usually called native born or US born. I usually prefer the term US born because we usually use the term Native Americans to the indigenous population that was originally here. And so whenever I'm writing papers or like also seeing other papers being published out there, people usually use the term US born to make it clear. US people that were born here, it's not necessarily Native Americans, not descendants of Native Americans. And foreign born are people in the US who live in the US were born outside, such as me, for example. And here we have the overall numbers. The US born population increasing over time is still expected to increase. And the foreign born population also are increasing over time. And this is in absolute numbers 42 million to 78 million, 276 to 338 US born. And this is the overall size of the population expected by 2060. And in terms of percentage terms, what's the percentage of the US population that's foreign born? It increased from 13.3, reaching around 14.3% now, and expected to reach around 19% by 2060. So not really huge increase, even though about all these discourse and of anti-immigration that we see in the country. And we're gonna discuss a lot about this uh, overall discourse that we see in the media about immigration. But when you look at the data, there is not really a surge on immigrants coming to the country if we, if we care about facts and science. One important change that we observe in the US is the composition of families. And here, Stephen Ruggles, he uh, divide them into corporate families, male breadwinner, dual earners, and female breadwinners. Corporate families are pretty much families living in the agriculture production. So I have a very small piece of land and we produce some things in our area, in our, on our land, and then we exchange with food in, in the market and so on. Male breadwinners are those families in which only the man in the household works outside of the household. Do earners, both partners, worked outside of the household. And female breadwinner, only the woman works outside. Or if it could be a household in which you have only the woman as well, not the man. And Stephen Ruggles, he's a professor at the University of Minnesota, and he's the director of the Minnesota Population Center, MPC, Minnesota Population Center. And the Minnesota Population Center has this really important project, which is called EPUMS, I-P-U-M-S. If you just Google IPUMS.org, that's actually their website to go direct there, you can get data for the US from the American Community Survey, the current population survey, health data, census data for the US all for free. And they also have census data from all countries in the world. So EPUMS has been like a really great source of data. And so Stephen Ruggles is the person who actually made the project 
started it and he's still the director. And he recently was also the director of the Population Association of America, it's the most important uh, demographer association in the US. And I follow him on Twitter. And he gave one interview some months ago to that newspaper, The Atlantic. And he was telling them in the interview that the population in the US changed the family composition to this more agricultural uh, based production, which called here corporate family to male breadwinner and now do earner. And he said that there was a lot of back and forth in the interview with The Atlantic. And at the end, the kind of the headlines of the, the article that The Atlantic wrote kind of said, oh, this composition that we have nowadays is really bad. And Ruggers, right after he saw those headlines of what was actually published, he put his tweet, say, hey guys, that's not what I said, right? I'm saying that family is the composition of who brings resources into the household has been changing. And I did not say that's bad that the proportion of households in which both partners bring resources to their household is bad. So he made that clear. So it's interesting to, to see these debates live going on. So what we see in 1800 is that around 90% of the households in the US were kind of like agricultural based and only 10% uh, they had only the father uh, of the household being the one working outside of the household. And in this chapter, there is a whole portion of the chapter that Dudley Poston discusses this family composition of the US in a historical manner. And I'm not going to go in detail on that portion, but Pretty much what this figure is saying and what Dudley Poston discusses in the textbook is that actually we have this idea that in past centuries, women already were not working to bring resources to, to the household. But what the data shows here is the opposite. Everybody in the household was working. Uh, the husband, the wife, and the children in these agricultural activities. After that, when you start to have more urbanization and it's still a really macho society, only men working outside. And as we get more equality in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, you start to see a higher percentage of households in which both men and women, they work outside of the household and bring and make money, bringing money to the household, okay? And proportionally, you also have a considerable increase in the households with uh, women, the only one bringing resources. In. And resources, I'm talking about money to the household, around 10% uh, in 2010, okay? But then you see this huge increase here, so it's around 70, 60% of dual earners. 10% of corporate family, and then another 20% of male breadwinners, right? So it's still a high percentage, but that's the normal that we see nowadays, both in the, in, in the, in the household working. Mortality in the US, um, we have seen uh, an overall decline in the crude death rate in the US. The crude death rate is that indicator in which we get in the numerator we saw in the previous lectures. In the numerator, we put everybody who died in a specific year, in this case, in the US. In the denominator, we get the population in the middle of that year. Divide one by the other and multiply by 1,000. So we had around eight people dying for every 1,000 uh, people in the US in 2013. This measure here, as we're going to discuss more uh, in detail in the chapter about mortality, we will um, see that's not a really good measure because when you have an older population, 
older people are more likely to die. And if you have this really simple indicator of putting the numerator, people, number of people who died divided by the population in that year, for older populations, for populations that have a higher percentage of older people, the crude death rate could actually be higher in, one, in a developed country than in a developing country, right? Exactly because you have more people dying because you have more old people. A better measure, a more widely used measure for mortality is the life expectancy at birth. The life expectancy at birth takes into account not just this indicator of overall deaths, this rate, the crude death rate of the overall population. The life expectancy at birth takes into account the mortality rates for each one of the age groups. For children below one year of age, children from one to four, what's the death rate, number of children that age that died in that year for the overall population of children in, in that age. For people between five to nine, 10 to 14, so you need much more data. So you pretty much need mortality rates for every, uh, every age group, usually five year age group. And the first age group is divided into children below year age one and children between one to four. And based on these mortality rates by age groups called age-specific mortality rates, you can calculate the life expectancy at birth. And I talked to you that this is a hypothetical mass, uh, measure. It's saying that if we expose a group of men to the mortality rates by age groups that were calculated from 2013, and you get this group of men and expose them to that mortality from age zero until everybody dies, they will live on average 76 years based on data from 2013, 81 years among women. And what we see is an increase in life expectancy at birth. That means a decline in mortality, right? But what we saw, we have been seeing like this increase over this last few decades from 1940 to 2013. And this is the data that I just got now from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC. You can look at their report on this link here. This is a report from this year, I think from July this year, showing that, yeah, life expectancy at birth has been increasing over time, both for women and for men. And again, women live longer. So in 2019, based on the mortality rates by age group for women, women would live around 81.4 years of age if they were exposed to those rates measured in 2019. Men, around 76.3 years. But what you observed in this last year between 2019 and 2020 is a decline in life expectancy at birth. So there is something that happens there, the pandemic. And that's huge because it's just showing that the pandemic had actually a substantial impact on the life expectancy at birth. You see here, that's really steep, this decline. Like women, the life expectancy at birth declined by 1.2 years, men by 1.5, and no, sorry, total 1.5, and men by 1.8 years, right? So these are huge numbers 1.5 years in total. And why do I say that's huge numbers? Because you even see the the slope of this curve here, how it's much steeper than the ones that we observed throughout all, all these years, right? And I got data from the CDC, reliable data, good methodology, concern with how we estimate this, all these indicators. If we break down life expectancy at birth by race, ethnicity, now focusing just in two years, 
2019 and 2020. All groups decline over time. Hispanic, no Hispanic white, and no Hispanic black. Those are the three race ethnicity groups being shown here. Of course, we have also no Hispanic Asians, no Hispanic Native Americans, and uh, other groups. But you see the declines in absolute numbers. They were steeper among the Hispanic population and the non-Hispanic Black. So exactly those groups that already have higher mortality, lower educational attainment, lower income, were the one uh, uh, that received the highest negative impacts from the pandemic in terms of impact on their life expectancy. Whites also declined, but not as steep as we see among Hispanics and no Hispanic Blacks. And that's not projection. It's based on data from 19 to 2019 to 2020. Change in life expectancy at birth. It's pretty much showing the change from 2019 to 2020 by race, ethnicity, and sex. For the Hispanic males have the steepest negative declines in life expectancy, almost four years of decline in life expectancy over all uh, Hispanic males. No Hispanic Blacks, males, decline of 3.3 years in life expectancy at birth. Women, African Americans, 2.4. Hispanic females, decline of two in life expectancy at birth from 2019 to 2020. And among white people, 1.3 males and 1.1 females. So they also experience, but the decline is much steeper among the Hispanic and the African-American population. And when you break it by race, ethnicity, and sex, you see who had the strongest negative effects. And usually the Hispanic male population and the African-American male population, they do jobs that are more in the front line, more essential jobs that are harder to do uh, online or social distancing, and then they get more affected by the pandemic than other groups, right? Contribution of leading causes of death to the change in life expectancy by sex. In the article, if you look there, this information, we also have it by race ethnicity, here I'm just showing it by, by sex. There are six or there are five other graphs that you can check it out there. And overall, so we know that life expectancy declined overall, right? Oh yeah, in this graph here, I'm not showing male and female because it will not fit in this slide. I'm just showing the total. And the total life expectancy at birth, we saw that it declined from 78.8 to 77.3. This decline from 78.8 to 77.3, 70, almost 74% of that decline, it's due to COVID-19. 11% due to unintentional injuries. These other causes here actually had positive contributions towards the life expectancy, but they were offset mostly by the pandemic. Okay, so just to show that this decline from 78 to 77, most of it is accounted for the pandemic. And if you look in that article, you just go to this link that it's in the slide. This is the short article that I, I got this data from. I just got the, the graphs from there. You, you have more analysis, more explanation about all these different, and you have this table showing the specific numbers. The one that I showed, I also show this one. This one is comparing groups I did not show there. This one I also did show. And this is the last graph that I showed. And then they show it also for men, for women, and then for specific race ethnicity groups. Hispanics, no Hispanic white, and no Hispanic Black, okay? So it's worth looking at this article. 
So the quiz is going to be open one minute from now at 2 p.m. on Canvas. On Thursday, we will have the exam. So there is no in-person class. The exam is taken in Canvas at any time between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. on uh, Thursday. Once you start the exam, you have one hour and 50 minutes to finish it, the same duration of the class. So don't start the exam less than one hour, 15 minutes before 8 p.m. Because otherwise the system is gonna close on you. And the topic of the exam, I will not cover these topics here of population change in the US because we did not finish the, all the chapter. So the topic will be only up to world population trends in the US, only up to the topics that we discussed here. Okay, and the quiz today is about this. The exam on Thursday is about this and everything before. Okay, thank you very much. It's now 2.01 and exam on Thursday and I'll see you again on Tuesday. Thank you.